Welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny Olson and this week we've got a great show for you. We're going to take you to northern Michigan for some bass fishing and you won't want to miss that story. There is some pretty cool underwater footage that goes along with that and Jimmy's been working on some other fun stuff for us too this week. Well, that's right, Jenny. We do have a few more things on this week's show. We're going to hit the Osabo River, do a little trout fishing, learn a new technique when it comes to trout fishing on that river. And we're also going to sit down with Russ Mason. Now, we did this last week. He is the chief of the Wildlife Division here in the state of Michigan. We're going to ask him about UP deer regulations and the wolf population up there. You won't want to miss that. Lots of good stuff on this week's show, so you stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, Dancing on the pine forest floor The autumn colors catch your eyes Here come the crystal winter skies It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors Someday our children all will see This is their finest legacy The wonder and the love of Michigan As the wind comes whispering through the trees The sweet smell of nature's in the air Great Lakes to the quiet stream Shining like a sportsman's dream It's the love of Michigan We all share Michigan Out of Doors is presented by By Greenstone Farm Credit Services Making recreational land ownership possible Across Michigan and Northeast Wisconsin Begin your land financing journey At one of Greenstone's 37 locations Or visit greenstonefcs.com by Vanguard, a global manufacturer based in Michigan, featuring rifle scopes, binoculars, and spotting scopes with lifetime warranties. Vanguard supplies sporting optics and accessories for the outdoor enthusiast online at vanguardworld.com. By Country Smokehouse, offering a variety of meat products, Country Smokehouse is located three miles south of I-69 on M53, just south of Imlay City. Country Smokehouse is a meat processor, a butcher, and a destination for sportsmen. We all have one. That perfect spot, a special place we go to smooth out the ripples of the day. Our perfect spot is calling. Our perfect spot is pure Michigan. Your trip begins at Michigan.org. Hi, I'm Jordan Brown, and we kick off this week's show on Walloon Lake, which is located up in the northwest part of the Lower Peninsula. And although this lake can easily be forgotten because there's so many good fishing lakes in that part of the state, one thing's for sure, it's home to some incredible bass fishing. looking for bedded fish. Uh, found about a hundred yesterday and uh, we're gonna mark them and back off of them and pitch a variety of soft plastics to them and hopefully get a bunch of them to bite today. Aggravate them into biting. They're all males. I didn't find any females yet but they're still fun to catch. Yeah, they make you mad. <laughs> look, at, look at that hook set. Right there in the snout. Walloon Lake is located just outside the town of Petoskey and like many lakes in this region of the state, it's home to some incredible smallmouth fishing. And with the fish having just moved into shallow water to spawn, the plan today was to target the beds. The fish in Michigan, um, you know, it, it starts in about the second week in May from the lowest part of Michigan and works its way all the way up to, let's say, Burton Mullet below Mackinac Bridge into June. And even out on Travers Bay, you're into July. So the water temperature gauge is that uh, when that temperature hits a steady 54 and that first full moon comes in, these fish are going to push to the bank and they're going to start setting up. And that's all male fish. They're coming in, they're cleaning their beds, they're making their beds, and they're trying to attract the biggest female or a female into their bed. And then once the female comes in, um, they'll do their little dance together. It's kind of fun watching them when they're on a, on a bed together. 
uh, the female will lay her eggs and uh, you know the male uh, will stay with the eggs till they hatch uh, and then stay with them for a while while they're on a fry basis but then uh, they'll start dispersing so in the fishes world the bass fishing world the male does all the work <laughs> Right in the snout. And again, I never felt him bite, and he was six feet off the bed when I started reeling him. He's got no scarring. This fish just came up. He's got nothing on his fan, nothing on his bottom fin. Uh, typically, at the end of spawn, they're going to be all bubbled up, red bumps all over them. And this fish isn't. He's clean. He just came up to spawn. This fish is really irritated. I'm getting too close to it. Ow. He really ate it though, but they've gone. And again, I had to leave it and let him swim off the bed with it. If, if I try to set the hook when the bait's in the bed and they're nudging on it, I can't get them. But if I just leave it there and then I see the fish off the bed, I know he's got the bait because he won't leave the bed unless he has the bait. So, so As we made our way around the lake, we continued to catch fish after fish, literally catching almost every bass we saw on a bed, with many fish coming well off the bed to hit the lure. Today we were throwing a variety of soft plastics, which is far and away the most common method this time of year. Uh, it's too easy sometimes. Oh, well, that's better for us. I mean, you just keep pointing them out and I'll keep <laughs> catching them, okay? Deal. <laughs> I loved, and again, none of these fish have any marks on them. It's, you would think this many is on beds they'd be all bubbled up but uh, they're not sore at all they're just real quality big red eyes I like to throw soft plastics mostly um, eerie darters tubes uh, Texas rig uh, small worms um, a variety of baits like that. Um, throw them on open jig heads, but a lot of this has got wood. There's a lot of wood in the water, so we have to Texas rig them, Texpose them, uh, so that we can get the bait to their bed uh, without hanging up in the wood. But when you're fishing a rock, an open hook is the best way to go. Um, they really like the, those types of uh, plastics. Uh, they're simple to use. Um, usually an eighth to a quarter ounce. You can also even throw top water on them. When they're really hard spawn uh, and you get a good row of them, uh, you can top water them and they'll, they'll come up and explode on the top water. That's a lot of fun to catch them that way as well. I was try, <laughs> trying to get it down to his bed, but he just came right out after it. You know, he just, he wasn't gonna have any of that. All right, so that was pretty cool. We put the GoPro camera stationed on the other side of the bed on the other side of the log. Because of the way the wind was blowing, we positioned the boat downwind of it. Hopefully the camera got the fish swimming on the bed. I drifted the bait through there, but the fish came off the bed to get it. So not sure that the camera actually got uh, the fish hitting the bait. But the fish was so aggressive that he was already hooked. But hopefully it turned out good because it was cool. After a few hours on the water, it became clear to me just how passionate Mark is about bass fishing, as he was just as excited with our 20th fish as he was with our first. Mark began bass fishing as a kid and has been doing it ever since. On top of fishing for fun, he also guides and fishes competitively all around the state. Yeah, I started out fishing at a very young age. My father was an avid fisherman and hunter. Uh, I was uh, very fortunate. Uh, he uh, took us on all the trips, uh, never left us at home. Uh, particularly bass season, it, it, we would always be out on opening day uh, and uh, just always loved it and been doing it ever since I was a young kid. Um, started guiding in, when I was in my 20s and really liked it and started tournament fishing and really liked that and uh, spent many years tournament fishing and uh, just started getting back into guiding again. The type of fishing we're doing today is targeting, targeting uh, spawning fish 
And uh, what I like about that is it's, it's like hunting. Um, you have to find them, you have to look for them, you have to target them, you got to mark them, and then you got to figure out how to catch them. Um, and that's the fun part for me, is uh, not just catching them, but is uh, getting out on the lake and hunting them down. So this is a good time of the year up north. Uh, Pre-spawn is really good up here as well. Um, you hit these lakes when the, when the water temperature hits in the 50s and uh, you're going to have a good time up in Traverse City. The water clarity in this region of the state really adds a certain uniqueness to the fishery, and this is clearly evident early in the year when fish are on beds, making them much easier to spot from long distances. This coupled with the fact that there's relatively low boat traffic compared to southern Michigan are just a couple of the reasons why Mark loves to fish this area of the state. The thing I like about coming up north fishing versus some of the smaller lakes at home, they're not uh, overrun with traffic. You can come up here and see bald eagles like we did today. We're, there's only two other boats on this water today. Um, it's scenic, uh, you know, it's beautiful up here. It can be a little chilly uh, at times, but it's just so beautiful up here. And, and most of the time through the week, you have it to yourself. There's not a lot, a lot of uh, power boaters and jet skiers, and, and it's just a fisherman's dream to be up here in paradise. You're right about it being a bigger fish. Yep. We ended the day having caught nearly 50 fish, and although we never did land one of the giants this lake is capable of producing, it's pretty hard to complain about catching fish left and right in the crystal clear waters of northern Michigan. Special thanks to Mark for a great day on the water here in Michigan's Out of Doors. Well, one of the best parts about working with Michigan Out of Doors Television is getting to travel all over the state and meet sportsmen and women that most likely I would never get a chance to have met. Well, that is the case in this next story, and in his own words, we're going to sit down with an angler who's going to teach us a little bit about the world of competitive fly fishing and show us a new technique when it comes to chasing trout. indicator monofilament and my leader tapers into it and what it does is it acts as a visual reference for depth when you're uh, when you're drifting nips okay. because with a typical leader you you kind of lose uh, reference of where your uh, nips are and also if you're ticking the bottom you know exactly how deep the water is you're drifting so even in cold water conditions you can just watch it and just see a, the slightest little twitch, even if you don't feel the hit. And it has a uh, black three millimeter bead, and it's tied on a uh, partridge of red itch, no, size 14 jig hook. And the beads are slotted, so when the, as it drifts along the bottom, it'll drift upside down. And the same with the point fly. This is the uh, Mayo orange pattern, also tied on the size 14 jig hook, but this has a four millimeter bead, so this will shoot both flies down to the bottom as quickly as possible. Competitive fly fishing is, is actually a huge sport in Europe. And it's, uh, it's slowly becoming popular in the U.S. Right now, there are about 50 to 60 regional and national tournaments that happen each year. And those tournaments happen within the Trout Legend League. It's much like uh, bass, bass angling, except there's no prize money. Usually no prize money larger than a few hundred dollars. And also, instead of being on a boat, you, ra you randomly select sections of river that you have a designated time to fish. 
The first time that I, that I competed was in Colorado, in Vail, Colorado. I just uh, got out of the Army and I had some time off so I decided that you know, I really want to take the sport to the next level and see where I stand against national competitors and also <clears throat> international competitors. I grew up fishing in Michigan. You know, I thought I was hot stuff, so I, I Googled fly fishing tournament and found that one. And I entered it and went, and I placed 67th out of 70. But as opposed to being disappointed, I knew that there was a lot I needed to learn about the sport. So instead of being a disappointment, it was more of a motivation. I'm not sure if it imitates a blood worm or a small night crawler, but they really look. And what I think is really important too is seeing how people fish from different regions across the United States. For instance, in my experience, I do a lot of tournaments in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, New York, um, West Virginia, Georgia even. And there's a, there's a huge difference between the way fly fishermen fish in the South and the way they fish in the North. What I learned also is there's a, there's a big difference between competitive style fly patterns and normal, I would say, typical style fly patterns that you see in fly shops. The one key difference is the hydrodynamics, less water resistant. Like as you can see, I'm not using a dubbing collar or a CDC. It's just straight pheasant tail some some copper wire, a three and a half millimeter bead, nothing to uh, nothing to slow the drift in the current or on its descent to the bottom when you're tight line nymphing. There are no frills, fly patterns. They won't win any any fly tying contest, but they're very efficient and they abstractly represent many species of aquatic insects. So as opposed to matching one hatch use abstract patterns like this to match multiple hatches. This was a unique style of fly fishing that I had not seen before. But whatever style you use, if you have not hit our blue ribbon trout streams with a fly rod in hand, you are simply missing out on some of the most beautiful places here in the state of Michigan. Well, as you can see, we never did quite catch that monster trout that we were hoping to find, but we had a great day on the river. Thanks to Jay for letting us spend some time with him. What we're going to do now is shift gears and head south to Lansing. Now, last week we sat down with Russ Mason, learned a little bit about chronic wasting disease and EHD, how that's affecting our deer herd. And we had been hearing a rumor that potentially there was going to be no deer hunting in the Upper Peninsula this year. We didn't know if that was true or not, so we went right to the man and we asked him ourselves. Was it true that you were considering not having a season in the, in the Upper Peninsula? I, I... No, the, categorically, the, the commission asked. You know, we had the third bad winter in a row. Last winter was apparently, you know, it was strange up front and then it turned a little yeah. milder, but the snowfall was about the same as in 2013. Hmm. So it was another hard winter, which is pretty unprecedented for the last 30 years or so. And our deer herd has suffered enormously in the UP. Um, folks are really going to see that this fall, I think, where we have even less recruitment. So 
the commission asked us, well, what could we do? Our first response is, well, we've got standardized regulations. You know, before we jump in, parachute into the system, let's look at things and do things deliberately over time because there are a lot of things that we could do with regard to our regulations and so forth. But they wanted additional options. So we said, fine, we'll give all of them to you. And they range from doing nothing to, frankly, shutting down the season. That's an option. Okay. may not be a good one, but it's an option. And then there are a couple in between. Uh, the two that they've settled on are doing nothing and uh, one that makes logical sense, which is to remove the antlerless option on a combo tag or a single buck tag during okay. archery season. Okay. The reason that makes sense is we twisted down the dials on antlerless harvest in the UP. There's really nothing else that we can do but that if you want to mm. preserve additional antlerless deer. There are no antlerless permits available in the UP except in uh, Delta and Menominee counties. And those are for damage control issues with regard to silviculture or for agricultural purposes, basically providing farmers in those very limited areas in the UP where there are more deer. Mm. Uh, in that banana belt to do something about okay. the, those, those, those issues. So the only thing that we had left was removing that antlerless option. Okay. So they're looking at those two. Frankly, it's a commission decision. Again, the Wildlife Division simply makes, rec you, you want some recommendations, here's some recommendations. Okay. So, so no season was thrown out there, but not really too considered as we, an actual... I don't remember how, gosh, we gave a whole bunch of options okay. to them, eliminating late and eliminating early. And, you know, none of those are going to do anything, literally okay. nothing. 2.2% of the statewide harvest is in about 2.2, 2 .2, I think, in uh, the early, the independence hunt, yeah. those hunts. Something around 3.5% is in the late antlers season. 7% okay. is muzzleloader, 30%, 33% is archery, and the rest is firearms. So if you really want to monkey with stuff, you go in here. You're not touching those peripheral things. They make, make people feel better but they have absolutely no impact whatsoever, biologically or anything else. They okay. just feel good. And they're still deciding which option they're going to go with. They're going to probably, okay. they're, the two that they've looked at are removing the antlers uh, opportunity for archers on the combo and the single buck tag or holding things the same. And I do not know which okay. way they're going to go. One of the consequences of the deer reduction is that we're seeing some prey switching uh, in, in large predators. Having said that, people, once again, I guess I can't say it often enough, uh, wolves are back on the federal endangered species uh, list through no uh, lack of effort on the part of the state of Michigan to keep them off that list. Right, right. It just is what it is, and so it is now a jurisdictional responsibility of the federal government. We do not have the ability to do anything with regard to that. I can't help farmers. I can't help dog hunters. So you can't do the depredation stuff anymore do, at all? I can't do anything. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, and don't throw rocks at them because if you hit them, that could get you in trouble. I mean, it's a, an extremely frustrating hmm. thing uh, for us, and it frankly points up one of the flaws in the Endangered Species Act hmm. uh, because it was a well-intentioned thing, and yet it's been used for these political agendas, whether it's, you know, you don't like uh, old-growth logging in the Pacific Northwest and the spotted owl becomes a surrogate. You don't like uh, people hunting, so wolves become a surrogate. And, yeah. It's very unfortunate. We hope to get our authorities back. I have every confidence that we will at some point, and you know, there are a number of efforts ongoing to okay. try to move things in that direction. Having said that, people then immediately go, well, coyotes are important too, aren't they? Well, yeah, coyotes are important. And in fact, coyotes are the workaday predators of Michigan. They, you, know, you can get really mad at wolves because they're big, but coyotes are a bigger deal. But then the question is, well, what are you going to do about them? Well, we're going to, I don't know, make the season all year round or whatever. Point is, you've got to kill coyotes. Every single coyote pair will produce six pups every single year. The average is six, sometimes seven, sometimes five. The average is six. How many of those pups make it into the world depends on food availability, which means that in years where you kill off a lot of adults, every one of those six is going to make it. Years where you don't kill off all of them, say three make it or whatever. You have to remove between 40 to 60 percent of the coyotes on the landscape every single year in order to drop a coyote population, which is another way of saying we're very mm. unlikely to accomplish that goal. Mm. But there may be other things that we can do, targeted removal of coyotes in deer yards or something that is more focused. That is the strategy that Wildlife Services has used for the last half century, you know, removing problem animals or places, removing animals from places where they're going to get into trouble as opposed to looking at a landscape level. 
suppression, which just isn't possible. It just mm -hmm. isn't. People think it is. I, okay, think it all you want. It's not possible. Thanks for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors, and special thanks once again to Russ Mason for taking the time to sit down with us. We will be visiting with him over the next couple of weeks for some additional information. And speaking of upcoming weeks, we've got a lot of fun stuff in store for you this summer. We'll take you out trout fishing over to the eastern end of the UP for a visit up there on some fishing trips. And we'll take a look at the first ever sturgeon festival here in Michigan. You won't want to miss any of that stuff coming up. Make sure you join us here on your PBS station next week for Michigan Out of Doors. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by by the Michigan chapters of Safari Club International. For over 40 years, SCI has been protecting hunters' rights and promoting wildlife conservation here in Michigan and around the world. SCI chapter locations can be found on the web at firstformichigan.org. By Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises of Munising, exploring Lake Superior's Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore with its sandstone cliffs, caves, waterfalls, and lighthouses. Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises on the web at picturedrocks.com. By Propane, clean American energy. Propane retailers promote the safe use of Michigan-produced gas energy in homes, farms, and businesses across our great state. Learn more at usemichiganpropane.com. By the Department of Natural Resources Fisheries Division, reminding fishermen that they are our first line of defense in stopping aquatic invasive species. To minimize the risk of invasives, it is required by law to properly dispose of live bait after your fishing trip. By doing so, you help protect Michigan's world-class fishery. Closed captioning is provided by the Michigan Propane Gas Association. Clean American Energy. Propane realtors promote the safe use of Michigan-produced gas to outdoor enthusiasts across our great state. When I want a far away, a dream stays with me night and day. It's the road that leads to my home state. I am a Michigan man.